Hello everyone, this is Dr. Tony Evans with The Urban Alternative, and I'm excited to welcome you to join us on a journey. A journey through Hebrews 11, it's known as the Hall of Faith, where men and women discovered what God can do when God's people learn to live, walk, and act by faith. The beautiful thing is, it's not just about them. It's about us. As the author of Hebrews writes to New Testament believers, that's who we are, about how the lives of Old Testament saints who learn to live by faith should challenge and affect our lives as we live by faith. So we're excited to welcome you on this journey. It's going to be an exciting trip. We're going to learn a lot. Most importantly, we're going to be transformed by the truth of what it means to be a kingdom hero who lives by faith. Far too many Christians are settling for the ordinary when you were redeemed for the extraordinary. We're settling. And at the heart of this settling is the lack of faith. Today, I want to talk to you about the power of faith. And we're introduced to our first, our first lady. Her name is Sarah, the wife of Abraham. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11, verses 11 and 12. By faith, even Sarah herself received the ability to, re to conceive even beyond the proper time of life, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, there was born even of one man and him as good as dead at that, as many descendants as the stars of heaven in number and innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. We're introduced to a lady named Sarah, the wife of Abraham. God had made a promise that he repeated five times in the book of Genesis from chapters 12 through chapters 21 that Abraham and Sarah were going to have a baby that would lead to the birth of a nation. That's what God said. That was, that was the word that came out of his mouth that was the promise. But the promise had a problem. The problem was, number one, Sarah was barren. Her womb was not producing any eggs, and so she couldn't get pregnant. But the promise was, you're going to have a baby. But the problem was, the ability to have a baby, she didn't have. So the promise didn't match the problem, and the problem didn't match the promise. Not only are we told she was barren, she could not, she didn't have the capacity to conceive, we're told that she was old, 90 years old. So she had, even if she had the power to conceive, had long past the timing of being able to conceive. There is a promise, but there are problems that contradict the promise. I can't conceive, I'm too old, so I have to question the promise. Now there are some folks here who are barren. There is, life's not working for you. What you thought life should produce, what you hope life would produce is not being produced. And you're in a barren season of no life. And that's after Jesus promised, I have come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. But right now, you're in a season of barrenness. You, you're not getting pregnant. That is, 
There, there, there is nothing being birthed in you. There's, your passion is gone. Your purpose is gone. Your destiny seems dim. Your, your get up and go spiritually has gotten up and gone. And, and you're barren. There are other people here who have been waiting for God to do something for a long time. And you're past the age. There's some ladies here who, who feel like they, I should have been married by now. Uh, there's some men here who are saying my career is not producing what it should be producing by now. I'm stuck in this same old job and I thought God had something better for me. You're running out of time. That was her sort of situation. Don't ever let the facts cancel out the faith. But verse 11 says, by faith she got the ability to conceive. So even though, stay with me, the facts are not in your favor. The facts, in fact, look contradictory to the faith. The problem looks bigger than the promise. That's the reality. While not denying the fact, don't let the fact cancel the faith. She is caught in a situation of a major promise. I'm going to build a whole nation from this one couple. So she decides... God has obviously made a mistake. So in Genesis chapter 16, in order to help God out, chapter 16 said, Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, Now behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children, Please go in to my maid. Perhaps I will obtain children through her. And Abraham listened to the voice of Sarah. Stay with me on that. I'm coming back to that. <laughs> and Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan. Abram's wife, Sarah, took Hagar the Egyptian, her maid, gave her to her husband, Abram, as his wife. He went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. The temptation. When you've been trusting God for something and God hasn't come through is to retreat to the flesh. The flesh is a human approach to solve a problem different than the way God wants it done. Sarah was trying to help God out. She says, perhaps God's promise is going to come through me giving you to our maid. So she goes to the flesh to accomplish a work of the spirit. So Abraham goes into Hagar. She has a baby named Ishmael and them two brothers have been fighting ever since because Ishmael is the father of the Arabs. Of course, Isaac is the father of the Jews and everything you see in the Middle East that's going on today is because Sarah circumvented God. She did what the Bible says don't do and that's be double-minded. So God had made a promise. This principle of flesh and spirit based on Hagar is brought up in the New Testament, by the way, in the book of Galatians chapter 4, because in Galatians chapter 4, Paul the Apostle writes in verse 21, tell me, you who are under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman, Hagar, and one by the free woman, Sarah. But the son of the bond woman was born according to the flesh, human approach. And the son of the free woman through the promise. He goes on to say, verse 27, For it is written, Rejoice, barren woman who doth not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. 
For more numerous are the children of the desolate than the one who has a husband. And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. But as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so it now is also. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir to the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, you are not the children of the bondwoman, but of the free woman. So he takes Abraham and he talks to the Galatian Christians, you and me, and he says, don't be a bondwoman's baby. Don't operate according to the flesh because the flesh and the spirit can never operate together. One of those kids and their mama had to leave. Hagar was put out. And he uses that to talk about law and grace. And he uses that to talk about uh, uh, how we ought to live our Christian life according to the spirit. God's point of view, God's promise, not according to the bond servant, the flesh approach. So if you and I want to experience the promises of God, the decision you have to make in order to experience that power is to not go to the flesh to help out the spirit. Even when it looks like there's no way the spirit approach can ever work. Because, guess what? The problem is to be. So Sarah comes up with this brilliant idea to help God out, and all she did was create a bigger mess. Anybody can testify to that? You began leaning to your own understanding. You tried to do this thing your way thinking you were going to help answer God's prayer for God, even though you were doing it in a way unprescribed by God. And now, oh my God, what did I do? Okay? That was Sarah's situation. And now there's chaos in the house, chaos with the kids, chaos with the, with the woman, chaos. Now we got a single parent on our hands who's out there trying to make it as a single mother. We got, we got blended family chaos that would become generational. So that's our situation. But in Genesis 17, God comes back to Sarah and Abraham and says, I told y'all, he didn't say y'all, but you got it. He said, I told you what we gonna do, verse 15. Then God said to Abraham, Genesis 15, 17, as for Sarah, your wife, you shall call her, not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and indeed I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and you shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed in his heart. So that's good news for folk who have messed up yesterday, and you're still hearing God's word today. But the problem is, even though they messed up, they had not grown up in faith. Because when God repeats his word, Abraham says, you got to be kidding me. He laughs. It's a joke. This is funny. She can't have a baby. She's old. And he laughs in God's face. Will a child, verse 17, be born to a man 100 years old? And will Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? All oh, that Ishmael, he says, might live before you. It's about Ishmael. Now, I just told you that this is going to happen through Sarah, and you, you keep going back to the flesh. You started with the flesh, and now you're staying with the flesh. And the reason why you started with the flesh and you're staying with the flesh is that the problem looks too big to be resolved. You say, I'm 100 years old now. My wife is 90 years old. She's barren. She can't have a baby. You, what are you talking? God, you talk this is a joke. Okay, but she, he's not the only one laughing. Chapter 18, verse 9. Then they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she's in the tent. He said, I will surely return to you this time next year. And behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door, which was behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old. We keep being told how old these people are. 
Sarah and Abraham were old, advanced in years, and Sarah was past childbearing. So they want to get this point over. The girl is old. When she hears this, verse 12, Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have become old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? She said, I, I, It ain't just about me. There are two folk with problems in this house. So God tells her, You're going to have a baby, and she breaks out laughing. This is the funniest thing she's ever heard in her life. She's laughing in the face of a promise. And the reason she's laughing is the problem looks too big. And so here we are. But when we started our sermon today, we started the sermon in verse 11 of the book of Hebrews which says, by faith, Sarah gained the ability to conceive. Didn't we read that? But I don't think we've seen any faith yet. We've seen the flesh. Okay? We've seen her laughing at God, not believing his word because his word sounds too ridiculous to come true. But in Hebrews 11, she gets pregnant by faith. That means something has happened between the time she's laughing and from the time she's had Hagar has given birth to Ishmael and the time Isaac is born in chapter 21. Something has happened in these chapters to spark faith in Sarah that she did not have. Now watch this. The gap between God's word and his promises and its fulfillment in your life is always tied to your development in faith. So here we are. The question is, what happened between chapters 7, 16, 17, and 18 from, from Hagar to Ishmael to him laughing to her laughing? to all of a sudden, she getting faith to conceive. Something happened. The first event is the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. God rained down fire and brimstone from heaven, and Abraham and Sarah got to see heaven open up, and they got to see the power of God destroy two cities at one time. They looked up and went, whoa, while saving his nephew Lot and his family, they saw the power of God manifested from heaven. That's the first thing that happened. But then there's a second thing that happened, and it's even deeper. Abraham is a fairly weak man. He goes to Abimelech, and he tells Abimelech, Sarah is his sister because he's scared. He feared that they're going to hurt him because even at 90 years old, Sarah was a very beautiful woman and he's so terrified of Abimelech that he says she's my sister. So Abimelech, thinking that Sarah is single, takes Sarah into his harem and he's going to make him one of the, either his wife or his concubines because he thinks Sarah is single because Abraham has said, she's my sister, not my wife. While he's sleeping, he has a dream. Verse 3 of chapter 20, God came to Abimelech in a dream that night and said, behold, you are a dead man because of the woman which you have taken for she is married. You're a dead man. To make a long story short, Abimelech said, I ain't know. He ain't tell me that. He told me she was a sister. You can't blame me. He said, I know, but I want to let you know how serious this is. So don't put your hands on her. Okay? Okay, don't touch her. And he says, I will deliver you 
If you keep my word and don't mess with Abraham's wife, who I know he told you is a sister. But now what's this all this got to do with Sarah getting pregnant? Verses 17 and 18 of chapter 20. Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maids so that they bore children. Now what's Sarah's problem? She can't have children. For the Lord had closed fast all the wombs of the household of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Okay, watch this now. You got, see, one of the things you have to learn to make is spiritual connections. You have to see how one thing connects with another. When Abimelech took Sarah, God closed all the wombs of Abimelech's house and all the wombs of Abimelech's kingdom. Nobody getting pregnant <laughs> until Sarah is out of here. When Sarah is out of there, everybody getting pregnant. Why is God including this story? To let Sarah know I control who gets pregnant and who doesn't get pregnant. I control that. So he let Abraham and Sarah see his power in Sodom and Gomorrah in the opening and closing of wombs in Abimelech's kingdom to increase their faith. And the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised because his promises are good. So Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the appointed time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Guess what Isaac means? Isaac means he laughs. Sarah couldn't have children and it says Abraham couldn't have children because he, he had even gotten too old. Both of them laugh at the face of God. So both of them needed to see God's power so that both of them could come together and have a baby. Okay, watch this now. The reason why Hebrews 11 and 11 and 12 are put together is because it would take the two of them having faith in order to produce the baby because the baby is dependent upon the two of them coming together. You say, well, that's Old Testament. Well, no, Hebrews 11 is New Testament and he's writing to New Testament Christians, but something else is New Testament. Stay with me here. The Bible says that Sarah called Abraham Lord. 1 Peter 5, 6. She got a miracle, the birth of Isaac, when she called Abraham Lord. And it says to the ladies, and you are her daughters if you do likewise. Now, I know what you're saying. I ain't trying to have no more babies. That's not the point. The point is she got a miracle. She got a miracle. When did she get the miracle? When was the miracle beginning to be put in motion? It says when she called Abraham Lord. What was it about calling him Lord that, that would trigger this thing beginning to move? Okay, remember? Remember how Ishmael came on the scene? Ishmael came on the scene because she took charge. She had become Lord of the house. Just like Eve had become Lord in the Garden of Eden and flipped the order. But that doesn't get the men off the hook because Abraham went along with her lordship. So she took over the role as Lord. He went along with her lordship. All hell broke out in their family. 1 Peter 3, 6 says, like Sarah, who called Abraham Lord. The question is, when did she call Abraham Lord? She, came, she called Abraham Lord in chapter 18. We just read it. She said, shall I have pleasure again from my Lord? That's when she called him Lord. When she took the position that recognized his position, and therefore their family got back in divine order, God was ready to reveal a miracle. I know some of you have been waiting for God for a long time. You've been trusting God for a while. God is still developing your faith. The problem looks bigger than the promise. But the reason God gives us her age is to let us know, or let uh, you and I know, that when God finally 
comes through in giving his promise, he gave her time to enjoy it. He made her wait 90 years, but he kept sister girl rolling for 37 more years. So even though the wait was long, she had 34 years with her baby boy. So once you get this faith thing right, and once you act in faith, and once God comes through, if it's a promise for you, he'll give you enough time to maximize your enjoyment and participation in it, but he won't do it as long as you keep going to the flesh. There is power embedded in faith. When you and I learn to live and act and walk and talk and move by faith, we can see God go beyond the ordinary and introduce us to the extraordinary. We can see the natural transformed into the supernatural because faith brings power alongside of it. Divine power, God's power that is not limited to what your five senses are aware of. Don't cut short the power of God operating in your life because you refuse to live by faith. I want to invite all men on a journey. A journey that has to do with why you matter. I know we're living in a day when the importance of men has been downgraded, has been reduced and in some places totally removed. Appropriate masculinity has gone unappreciated and undervalued. But God is calling men to rise to a whole new level. Remember God asked Adam a fundamental question. Adam, where are you? I like to say, Adam, where you at? Because this whole future of civilization will be keyed in to fulfilling your God designed, God created and God given role. So men, it's time to rise up. Over the next number of months, we're going to be challenging men to a new level of manhood, personal, family, church, and cultural impact. And when God's men rise up, things are going to change. When we fail to rise up, as the Bible makes clear, things will disintegrate. So join me. Let's go on a journey together and see what happens when kingdom men Right. Every responsible man here ought to have a will. If you are a man and you have a family, you ought to protect their future. And that comes through having a will. A will is a legal document that says that what you have accumulated in your life, this is how you want it passed on.
to those that you leave behind. To not have a will is to say, I want somebody else to determine where what I have been able to accumulate, the assets of my existence, I want somebody else to determine where they go, how they are distributed, and where they wind up. But a responsible man wants to be ahead of that and make the determination of where their assets are to go. You see, to create a will is saying you are future-minded. You won't always be here. So you're going to be thinking about tomorrow, today, in your financial or asset planning. Unfortunately, what many do not understand is that there are not only wills of physical assets, there are wills of spiritual assets. What you pass on generationally that has spiritual value attached to it. And unfortunately, many men who don't even bother to pass on physical assets refuse to pass on spiritual assets, one or both, because they're not future-minded. And as a result of not being future-minded, there is chaos in the future because there was not clarity set forth in the present. The Bible has a lot to say about legacy, about what is passed on to the next generation and beyond. In fact, Proverbs chapter 13 verse 22 says, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Translation, a bad man leaves no inheritance to his children's children. So if there is no future planning, you cannot be dubbed a good man. Because a good man is not only thinking about what's happening with him today, but what will happen on a three-generational level. He's concerned about today, he's concerned about his children, and then he's concerned about his children's children, his grandchildren. So a man who's not 
three generationally minded, God says he's not a good man because he's not thinking long term. He may only be thinking about today as though tomorrow will never come. So every man, all of us as Christians, but specifically to men, a good man, has to be generationally minded at least three generations long for God to call you good. In Judges chapter 2 verse 10 it says that there grew up a generation who did not know Joseph, who did not know his God. And as a result, chaos ensued. And when you read the book of Judges, you have a culture in perpetual chaos because there was a transfer of the spiritual baton that did not occur. In fact, the book of Judges says, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes because there was no king in those days. There was no standard that had been passed on. Today we live in a day of societal chaos. And that chaos can be rooted back to men who refuse to build a spiritual legacy. Men who refuse to man up to God's requirement for biblical manhood. And like it or not, God starts with holding the man responsible for how the legacy works out or does not. God says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He never says, I am the God of Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel. It's not because he's against the women. It's just that the man was responsible. The whole con condemnation of the human race is tied to a man. The Bible says, in Adam all die. Doesn't say in Adam and Eve. Only in Adam, the man, all die. That is because the man was held responsible. So like it or not, want it or not, that's just the way it is. And so we're introduced in this passage of Scripture to a man named Asher. Asher. Let me tell you a little bit about Asher. Verse 30 says, Asher had four sons and one daughter. Asher was the father of five children. And when we end the story of Asher, as you'll see, he comes out pretty good. But he didn't start that way. You see, Asher is the seventh son of Jacob. He is the first son of Zilpah. The seventh son of Jacob. If he's the seventh son of Jacob, that means he's been raised in a dysfunctional family. Because as far as Jacob's family was concerned, Papa was a rolling stone. Wherever he laid his hat was his home. Because Jacob had 12 kids by four different women. Jacob created chaos in his family. Asher the seventh son of Jacob, participated with his brothers in putting Joseph into the pit. So he was part of the conniving group of siblings that wanted to ruin their brother's life. His daddy, Jacob, was known as the trickster or deceiver. He knew how to game. And so he played games all of his life and that rolled over to his children. So Jacob, the patriarch, created havoc in his family due to his deception. It rubbed off on his boys. His boys destroyed or tried to destroy one of their brothers. He wasn't raised in a good, healthy home environment. It wasn't the kind of environment that would have been, have been inducive 
to an orderly family structure. There are men here, and since he had a daughter, there are women here who have been raised in dysfunctional families. Well, before you ever get to 1 Chronicles chapter 7, that's Asher. That's his history and his background. It's not a pretty one. It's not to be one to be proud of, but somewhere along the line, there was a transformation that occurred in the life of Asher. Because when we read about him here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we're going to give you some good news. So the good news that I want to give all of us here today, especially the men, but the principle applies to all of us, is that your past doesn't have to determine your future. That no matter how messed up your yesterday was, does not have to control what your tomorrow will be like. That you have an option to change your legacy. And that the legacy bequeathed to you does not have to be the legacy you dispense to others. Whether it is your immediate family, whether it's your siblings or those who come under your influence. Such is the case with the change and transformation that took place in the life of Asher. Well, let's go to verse 40 because we'll see four things of Asher's impact and his legacy that ought to be true of every man and every head of household who is here. All these, verse 40 says, were the sons of Asher. Heads of the father's houses.
heads of the father's houses. His four boys became heads of houses. They became leaders in their family. Head of a house is a leader of a home. Whatever Asher did when he got right, so influenced his four boys that they were able to take up responsible reigns in their own families. It says that his sons became heads of households, that is, leaders within their home, that is, they were willing to own the responsibility for the family. The government's not supposed to raise your children. The neighborhood is not supposed to raise your children. The father in the Bible raises the children, Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers raise your children. The man has to own it. He raised his sons to be leaders, to be responsible. As one woman said to her husband, if you're not going to wear the pants, then go to my closet and pick out a pair of mine. That is to own the biblical, responsible role of headship. You say, I haven't seen it. I don't know what it looks like. Then like anything you need to know about, you learn it. But what you don't do is ignore it. Because every man has been called, if he has a family, to operate as head, the responsible person in it. Now, that does not mean you're the most gifted. Your wife may be, have greater leadership skills than you. She may have better organizational skills than you. But that has nothing to do with headship. Headship is not the most skilled person. It's where the buck stops. It's the responsible person. So God has given you the office. While you hold the office, you learn the gifts of those for whom you're responsible, and you maximize those gifts so that your office looks good. Headship is responsibility. Headship also involves direction. It involves direction. Whether it's a president or the head of a company, or the head of a church, or whatever, headship means you are casting a direction so that people know which way we're going. If you're lost and you got folk following you, they're going to be loster. <laughs> Since they don't know where you're going, they're either going to follow you nowhere or decide they don't want to go nowhere, they'd rather go somewhere so they create their own vision. To be ahead means that I want to be in close proximity with God so that God can speak to me by his Holy Spirit and give me direction so that those following me will have a place to go. So if the man, if God can't give the man clarity, then those following him, Joshua says in Joshua 24, 15, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm going to set the spiritual, which is the most important, the foundational, the biblical direction. And what that means is that you're not following the crowd. So you're picking up your cues from him. So Asher recovered in some way and he raised his sons to be heads of households with fire and vision. You're going to be the head. You just can't see the acorn. You got to look at the oak. You got to see bigger than what is, yeah? Things are not looking good, but, but me and God got to get together and we got to find out how he wants us to fix this, correct this, straighten this, reorient this. Why? Because you just said you the man. You say you the man. Well, if you the man, you got to man up. in a responsible biblical way. The second thing we find out about Asher's sons is he calls them choice men. Choice men. 
That means cream of the crop. Choice men. They weren't, they weren't run-of-the-mill guys. Somehow in this turnaround, he said, my boys are not going to be like everybody else's sons. My, my boys are not going to just run with the crowd. I'm going to raise up some excellent choice, cream of the crop boys with one daughter. I'm going to raise them up to be the men that God has created them to be. I'm not going to let them settle. I'm not going to let the boys settle. They're not going to be just like everybody else. They're not going to come in here talking about what my friends say if their friends are wrong. I'm not going to let them hang out with anybody because they're going to be excellent, which means I'm going to give them a standard to shoot for. I ain't going to let social media, I'm not going to let Twitter, I'm not going to let Instagram, I'm not going to let Facebook set my kids' standard. I'm going to raise some choice boys up in here, up in here. There's going to be a divine standard that I, that I give them, that I want to model before them, that I want to teach them, that I want to expose them to. He says his boys became choice boys. High character, high integrity, high standards. The third thing it says about Asher's Sons, he speaks in particularly of. He says they were mighty men in verse 40. Mighty men. They were raised to be warriors. Mighty men. Not mediocre men. These are, these are some mighty dudes. They were raised to be warriors. See, you have to understand we're in spiritual warfare here, we're in a war. You now have to fight for your kids. Well, right now, you and I live in a post-Christian era. It's called post-modernism, where the absolute standards of right and wrong no longer apply. So people are making up their own rules as they go along of what's right and wrong. So you better not just send them out to play with anybody. You do have to watch what they're being taught in school. And so, he raised warriors. You've got to go to war. You've got to fight. He says he raised warriors, men who would fight, who would battle for his kids, his family, and who would be willing to take the hit. Fight for your kids. Fight for the future. Wage spiritual warfare. You take them before the throne of grace. You take them, you, you have devotions with them. You pray over them. Go to war because the devil is going to war for him. He says he raised his sons to be warriors, to fight for that which was right. And then he says, fourthly, he raised them to be mentors because he says, heads of the princesses. He raised them to be mentors. You see, a prince is a king in waiting. He says he raised, they were heads of princesses. They were, they were raising future kings. He says, they were mentored. They were raised as princesses, that is, position for future kingship. And so the question is, what level of mentoring are we giving our kids? And remember, to the third generation, our grandkids. Many a young man has been spiritually castrated because he's not been given a sense of his royal standing in the family and most importantly with the Lord. They've been duped and ripped because there's no godly male figure who loves God, who loves them, who gives them a biblical worldview and who spiritually imparts to them so that they take all of God into all of life, into all of their world. But the good news is that God 
can change your yesterday, no matter how messed up it is, and give you a different tomorrow. I know your daddy wasn't there, or he was a bad daddy that was there. I know you've had bad experiences, and you've had sins and rebellion. I know all that, but then all you are is just give yourself a name. Call yourself Asher, because you got some dysfunction in your history. But the good news is he shows up in chapter 7 of 1 Chronicles, a brand new man. So your yesterday doesn't have to control your tomorrow. Because look at how this thing closes. It says at the end of verse 40, and the number of them enrolled by genealogy for service in war was 26,000 men. Oh, wait a minute now. We started off with one man, four sons, and one daughter. But the time, by the time this man got through, he got 26,000 in his legacy that are ready to go to war. See, you just can't be thinking about you. You got to be thinking about the generations behind you, and you got to build yourself an army, an army of men and women. That meant women were in it because more boys were being born, and so you got to build yourself an army. The problem is Satan has been building his army while God's army has been shrinking. So we got to build an army, 26,000 men. You got to have a bunch of folk who take a stand with God and with one another. So what God is looking for are men who want to recover, men who want to get back the dignity that God created you with, who want to fulfill the role that God has given you. In Super Bowl 43, when Santonio Holmes caught the pass that won the Super Bowl, don't forget, one minute earlier, he had dropped the ball. Ben Roethlisberger threw him the ball and he dropped it. But then Ben Roethlisberger called him back and said, I'm going to throw it to you again, and this time don't drop it. So if you've dropped it yesterday, you got kids you don't live with, kids you sired that you don't talk to, grandkids that you don't know, okay, you dropped the ball, but God's ready to throw you another pass. And now you got to be willing to catch the ball and move from here. You say, but I wonder whether it's too late. Well, no, it can't be too late. Because in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 21, it says that Jacob, even with his grandchildren, recovered because he blessed his grandchildren while he leaned on his staff just before he died. So if it's too late with your kids, get your grandkids so that you reach them and impact them for time and eternity. God is a generational God. He regularly speaks about one generation to another. He talks about, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He talks about a good man leaves an inheritance to his children. children. God is a generational God, so men must think and function generationally. It's not just about your life, nor is it just about your children. It also includes your grandchildren. When we do not think about cross-generational impact, we're not thinking about legacy. And if we're not thinking about legacy, that means we don't care about the future. We must make our decisions now in light of the generations to come. When we do that, not only do we give ourselves purpose and dignity and impact. We give our names longevity. Remember, legacy is more than a name. Legacy involves the kind of impact you make in the lives of others in such a way that you inspire them through your legacy to build and transfer their own.